First it pops. So let me go ahead and share screen. Uh, I will share a slide deck that's one PDF for each of the poster pop people. Let me go ahead and get my timer ready. So what will happen is I will uh, set a one minute timer just myself and then I will switch to the next uh, poster at one minute. So when, if you notice the poster change, uh, that means that your, your time is up. So thanks everybody for, for going through this with us. Um, we noticed that uh, Rob Zellum from JPL, he did not submit a poster slide. And it looks as though he's not on the participants list. Rob, are you there? All right, going once, going twice. Uh, we'll go to the next one. Oops. All right, uh, Nicole, take it away. Hi, my name is Nicole Wallach and I'm a grad student at Caltech. I'm presenting a poster on the project that I've been working on to study the thermal emission of planets observed with Spitzer. There are only a few planets that have extensive thermal emission data available, and there's been difficulty with matching models to these data, so it's been hard to see the full picture of the thermal emission of short period gas giants. So instead of focusing on the few planets with extensive data sets, we decided to focus on the entire population of short period gas giants with warm Spitzer data. Despite only having two data points per planet, we can leverage the fact that we have nearly 80 planets to investigate trends in the atmospheric composition and circulation patterns of short period gas giants. Using just the Spitzer data, we can see hints of molecular absorption features in individual systems, but we can also see patterns in circulation efficiency and trends in atmospheric composition with different system parameters. For example, using our sample, we're able to see a trend in the spectral shape in the Spitzer bands with planet temperature, and we're also able to see the hotter planets seem to have less efficient heat recirculation. So please come talk to me in the poster discussion Slack channel for more information. Thanks. Right on time. All right, uh, Taichi Uyama. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Taichi Uyama, postdoc at Kartika at Park. Uh, in this conference, I'm presenting the recent Skeksel Kais high contrast, high contrast imaging of uh, protoplanetary disk HD34700. Uh, we uh, combine uh, reference, reference differential imaging and another combination of angular differential imaging and scriptural differential imaging and confirm the similar results to GPI uh, by showing a large cavity on the central star and the ring feature as a, with the discontinuity at north direction. And we confirmed the, a bunch of uh, spars. And uh, by comparing our result with the GPI result, we nearly confirmed the, uh, a bunch of uh, uh, shadowing or kind of uh, physical feature, we call it uh, darkening features uh, in the manuscript. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, we uh, expanded for modeling from uh, J to K banner by showing the good match except uh, darkening features. And indeed, in this conference, we, uh, we should give another uh, Skeksel cultural results uh, led by Karen Lawson, uh, observed, uh, the observed HD11511 debris disk. Uh, if you are uh, sorry, uh, I pass it. All right, thanks. <laughs> uh, I have uh, Rui Peng. Hope Hi, you guys. This is Rui from Caltech. Over recent decades, a bonus simulation has become a standard tool for us to study the gravitational dynamics in planet forming disks. But the self semi active thermal particles are widely used in order to reduce computational cost and mimic dynamical friction. But no one has ever checked the potential on physical excitation between these small particles. Therefore, here we point out that non-interacting particles can still interact in planet formation simulations. Their velocity dispersion depends on the mass of the disk and the particle numbers. This is not a numerical artifact. Finally, we note that this could be an issue for heavily massive disks, but it might not be a problem for real astrophysical applications. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, next we have Mike Lund. Hello, so this is the quick three figures and like nine words of text for the actual poster. Um, and what this is dealing with is work that's been going on using adaptive optics in order to try to look for stellar companions. And this is particularly re um, relevant when we look at tests because the pixels are so large that you can hide a whole lot in a pixel around a star in TESS. Um, and the net effect that this has, as shown in the top figure, is that if there's an undetected stellar companion, like that red star in the bottom left in the, in the image inset, 
you are going to measure the transit depth incorrectly. And so by using AO, we can remove the number, the range of possible stellar companions that are undetected. And so in the bottom left figure, we have contrast curves for, for one of the TOIs is the two red lines. And then a large population of simulated possible stellar companions. And any of those points that show up in that figure that are above those contrast curves would be detected. And so then we only have to look at what is the likelihood that there is a star that would fall below those, those contrast curves that would be undetected and look at the poster for more information. All right, thanks Mike. Uh, next we have Briley Lewis. All right, hi everyone. My name is Briley Lewis. I'm a third year grad student at UCLA working on high contrast imaging. And I'm also one of the UCLA planetarium coordinators. So I'm here to talk to you about our efforts for outreach. So the planetarium is UCLA astronomy's largest outreach effort. And when we can have in-person shows, we serve around 4,000 visitors each year. We do shows for the general public each week that are just open to anyone in the community. Um, we have private shows for school visits and also for field trips. Um, so schools in the Los Angeles area come and they have field trips to us, which are really fun. And then we also do shows for UCLA courses. The planetarium is fully staffed by graduate students. Um, we've been running this and providing shows for over 60 years now. And we've been trying to transition to virtual now because of COVID-19. So our first YouTube live show had over 1,700 attendees. Um, and our second YouTube live show had over 300. Um, so it's been going well so far. But if anyone has any suggestions for how to run virtual events or ideas of things that we could work on, or ideas for funding, which we're always looking for. Uh, talk to me in the plan in the poster channel on the planetarium poster. Great, thanks, Riley. Um, we also noticed that uh, Jamie Jasinski from JPL um, had not submitted a slide, or we did not see them in the participants. Uh, Jamie, are you here? Uh, going once, going twice. Okay, we'll go to the next one. Uh, now we have one of our very own LSC members, uh, Tara. Please take it away. Hi, I'm Tara Featheroff. I'm a postdoc at UC Riverside. Um, so I'm working on characterizing transiting exoplanets using the non-transiting portions of their light curves. Modulations, in, uh, uh, modulations that occur as a planet orbits around the star are called phase variations, and these variations are typically caused by gravitational or reflection effects in the light curve, or between the star and the planet. Um, I'm lurking on performing a phase variation analysis on all of the known and candidate planets that have been observed by tests in order to uh, investigate whether a phase variation analysis is useful for characterizing exoplanets and performing planet candidate vetting. I'm also interested in looking at unusual phase variation signatures that may not necessarily be ca caused by gravitational or reflection effects and could be caused by other astrophysical mechanisms. If you're interested in hearing more, check out my poster on the Slack. Thanks. Perfect. One minute on the dot. Uh, thanks. Uh, next, we have uh, Yasuhiro from JPL. Oh, hey, guys. Uh, I'm Yasuhiro from JPL. Uh, my research interests uh, planet formation, protoplanetary disk, big data, and machine learning. Actually, in this post, uh, basically, the, uh, my recent effort is summarized where the property of the accreting giant planet around the PDS 70B, uh, 70 was basically summarized. Well, what, I, what I found is that you know, the, uh, basically the weak magnetic field possible for PDS 70 you know, to reproduce the H alpha observation and other properties, but then the, it seems that you know, the strong uh, magnetic field is much more preferred to reproduce these observations. And then one of the uh, interesting uh, implications of this study is that uh, if you take into account the uh, planetary magnetic field, basically the surface density is increased if the distance is increased at a near at the inner edge region. So that's why maybe that kind of property serves as a trap for the migrating satellite or uh, regularly drifting the dust particle. So if you are interested in the, uh, this uh, topic, uh, please check, uh, check my post or contact me. Thank you. Great, thanks for being here. Uh, next we have Sarah Harder. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Harder and I'm a recent graduate at CSU Northridge. I have been doing my research on quantifying the potential for the next generation via very large array. Uh, we, in my research, we are looking at a bunch of really low mass planets that are really close to the central star in distances of 3 AU or less. 
our planet masses are looking around 10 Earth masses to one Earth masses, and we can resolve structures as low as one Earth masses at, at 3 AU. We look at the star forming region of Taurus that's around 140 parsecs away. It's very exciting to see that these structures can be resolved so, uh, or these structures can be resolved at such short distances with such low mass planets. Uh, to check out more, see my poster on Slack. Great, thanks so much. Uh, I think that's the end of Poster Pop session one. So thanks to uh, Kaylin, uh, Kaylin. Uh, Rob. Rob is actually here. So uh, would you mind just going to his like title slide and give a little spiel real quick? Yeah, yeah. Let's go back up. Hi, Rob. Uh, hey, everyone. Sorry, I wasn't able to raise my hand in time or unmute myself. Um, I'm just a bit jittery because of all the forest fire stuff I've been dealing with yeah, in Monrovia. So um, quickly. Um, Nancy Grace Roman CGI is awesome. You should all be very supportive of it. That's the TLDR. But also, I wanted to plug for two uh, lecture lecture series on the entire mission as a whole. If you're working on Roman or something uh, tangentially related to Roman and you want to give a talk, please email me at rzellum at jpl.nasa.gov. Also, I am uh, in charge of um, putting together the Exoplanet Journal Club. So, if you want to give a short 30 minute talk 11 15 to 11 5 on mondays to our uh, exoplanet group at jpl we're always looking for speakers graduate students postdocs are encouraged to apply and to submit and give talks as well so we're definitely looking after those uh, early career folks again if you're interested just shoot me an email at rzone.jpl.bassa.gov and then i'll throw in some chat somewhere a link you can get Great, uh, thank you, Rob, and, and good luck staying safe and taking care. For those outside of Southern California, uh, yet another reason to have uh, an indoor, you know, separate conference is that we're all dealing with the fires. So um, hopefully that doesn't, you know, present more of an issue than it already has. Um, but thank you, everybody. So now I'm going to stop sharing the screen, and what we're going to do is try. Uh, let's see how do I do this. There it is. Uh, so one of the other things that we uh, on the SOC uh, wanted to try out to, to kind of give the sense of a more interactive in-person uh, conference, uh, even though it's virtual, uh, is what we're calling speaker science trivia. So at the end of each of the eight sessions, uh, what we're going to do is we've asked speakers to submit a single multiple choice question with answer. And what we'll do is we will, uh, uh, the LSC is setting these up as a Zoom poll. Uh, and so the idea is that everybody will see this question through Zoom uh, and you'll be able to click a single answer for those of you uh, who haven't done this before. And then after we take a, a couple of minutes to go through what for this session is three questions, uh, we'll show the answers uh, and, and then we'll say which one is actually the correct answer. Kind of as an opportunity as well for the speakers to get one more chance to, to emphasize their main takeaway science point. Um, so I think I have the Jeopardy theme song queued up. <laughs> Let's see if this works. Yeah, so Colby, if you could uh, launch the Zoom poll. Wait, so everybody should see this uh, on their screen in their Zoom window. We've got about half of people who have uh, answered so far. It looks like answers are still trickling in, so we'll give another minute or so.
All right, it looks like we've we've leveled off uh, at about two thirds of people having voted. So let's go ahead and uh, close the poll. Oh, I see. All right, so question one, and this was actually uh, a little bit different order than the actual speakers. Uh, so what is the angular resolution of an interferometer array that observes a wavelength lambda with telescopes separated by distance d? Lambda over d, 1.22 lambda over d, lambda over quantity 2d, uh, or <laughs> a lot. Um, the correct answer uh, is lambda over 2d. So nice job. About 60% of people got that. Uh, that was from uh, Jason Wong's talk. Uh, number two, this is from Steph Salen's talk. How does aperture masking provide sub-diffraction limited resolution? So the options were by creating an interferometric array with only redundant baselines, by allowing you to make phase combinations that eliminate instrumental errors, uh, or by creating a dark hole in the focal plane. Uh, so a little bit over three-fourths of people got the correct answer. Uh, next job, which is by allowing you to make phase combinations that eliminate instrumental errors. Uh, and last but not least, this is from John Zink's talk. Uh, question three, our K2 campaign five exoplanet demographic study shows a deficit of planets when compared to the Kepler field. This is likely due to the unique stellar samples in each field. Which stellar feature is likely responsible for this occurrence difference? So we had stellar temperature, stellar radius, stellar metallicity, and stellar mass. Uh, and the correct answer, 81% people got right, is uh, stellar metallicity. Uh, so thanks everybody, uh, let's give uh, thanks to the speakers for submitting questions, uh, and thanks to the speakers and the host of pop presenters. Uh, let's give them one more round of applause. I know people can't see the video, but it's a standing ovation. Uh, everybody's very excited. They're also wearing suits, which I think is not accurate for the pandemic. Uh, so thanks, everybody. We're, we're actually uh, basically right on schedule. So this first break here is designated as a poster session. So we encourage everybody to go check out the Slack channel. Uh, we have an entire, uh, the Slack space, we have an entire Slack channel uh, dedicated to the poster discussion, poster underscore discussion. Uh, and if there are any follow up questions uh, or questions that we didn't get to, but that were written down during the Q&A for a given speaker, those are also written in the session specific channel. So session underscore one underscore series. Uh, so Thanks everybody, and the plan will be to reconvene at 11 a.m. Pacific time for the start of session two Pluto. Uh, so thanks, and we'll see you in about 20.